right, friends, let's talk about the cross. It has come to be understood as the defining symbol of the Christian faith, and yet we see them everywhere, not only in churches. Sometimes crosses turn up in some pretty strange places. Um, I've seen them on cars, trucks, even on the backside of blue jeans, bedazzled and rhinestones. Our local fair is happening this weekend, and there happens to be a booth in the commercial building with stacks of such jeans. I kind of almost want to hang out there for an afternoon and just ask the customers, what does it mean to you to wear a cross there? What does it mean to wear a cross at all? If you wear a cross, why? What does it mean to you? What does the cross mean to anyone? This is a great question to ponder, especially if you don't feel that you will be compelled to share your answer and risk being judged for it. I think sometimes we answer questions like this the way we think we're supposed to answer them, the way we've heard others answer them, or maybe the way we think our pastor wants us to answer them. But before we talk too much about what the cross means to us, let us begin with what the cross meant to Jesus because he is the reason we are even talking about the cross in the first place. Now, Jesus didn't talk much about the cross after the actual crucifixion, as far as we know. Of the few documented conversations between the resurrected Jesus and his followers, there really aren't any that reflect much upon his experience on the cross after the fact. Whenever Jesus does talk about the cross, it's to explain that he is headed to it and his disciples react as you would expect. For them, the strangest place to imagine a cross is in Jesus' actual future. Here's an example of one such disturbing conversation which takes place right after Peter has named Jesus as the Messiah, a revelation which led to Jesus naming Peter as the leader of the movement. Now, Peter was probably confused about why Jesus wasn't planning to be the leader himself of his movement, but Jesus would make sure that they all understood. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any wish to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? Words from Matthew chapter 16. Those are not words of comfort, though, from any leader, are they? How surprising these words must have been to Peter and the others. They wanted to take up swords. Taking up a cross meant losing, losing the fight for justice, losing their credibility as people with a better way, and yes, losing their lives. If Jesus and his disciples all took up crosses and died at the hands of the Roman Empire, how was that advancing their cause of helping anyone survive the evils perpetuated by that empire? And what's up anyway with Jesus demoting Peter from the leader of the group, the rock upon which that growing movement would be built, and calling him Satan? Let's start there. That's an easy question. Satan comes from the Hebrew words ha-satan, meaning the accuser. It's not the name of a character. It's more like a job description. Ha-satan, the accuser, would be the person in a courtroom who brings the charges against the defendant. You might think of it as a prosecuting attorney whose job it is to tell the accused persons what they've done wrong or maybe intimidate them with questioning, trying to break them down. Now, Jesus has already dealt with this once before while he wandered through the wilderness during his long fast, hearing the voice of Hasatan, the accuser, which questioned his identity as the son of God. If you are the son of God, prove it, show the world how amazing you are, take care of yourself. You know you deserve more than what life has given you. You could have power and fame and fortune, all of it, if you are the Son of God. 
Jesus had remained strong against that accusing voice, resisting the temptation to choose an easier path. He knew what he was up against, and he knew the likely outcome of his calling to lead people in a countercultural movement that would defy the powers that ruled the day. Hasatan, the accuser, showed him easy street, but Jesus' path would lead him to the cross. And now Peter is doing exactly the same thing, standing in his way, forbidding him from continuing the work. If Jesus listens to Peter, he has a chance to survive. He could skip town, live somewhere else, maybe under an assumed name, suffer no consequences. But then the work of building God's kingdom would also stop and suffering would continue large scale for so many. The question Jesus asked Peter is a question on his own mind. What would it profit him if he gained the whole world but forfeited his life? His life work, that is. Saving his life would cause him to lose much more than he would lose on the cross. His mission was much more important than living a long, empty life, just trying to survive while watching others suffer under burdens too heavy for them to carry. Jesus would dedicate his entire life trying to lighten those burdens, even if it sent him to the cross. Peter didn't understand it this way. When he realized that Jesus was the Messiah, he imagined something quite different. For Peter, following the Messiah sounded like the road to glory and fame. Trying to redirect Jesus to something more along those lines, he didn't know he was just echoing the silky persuasions of the accuser. How was he supposed to know he hadn't been there in the wilderness? Admittedly, Peter was pretty slow in understanding that everything Jesus had done for the people was just that, for the people, for the glory of God and no one else. But Peter wasn't the only one who was slow in the uptake. Really, none of those early followers seemed to comprehend that what Jesus did was done in an effort to bless the world so beloved to God, not as a way of building fame and prestige for himself or for himself and his closest followers. For Peter, this conversation with Jesus represents a crossroads in his life. Peter has been content to follow Jesus this far, but now hearing what it really means, he has a choice to continue in harm's way or to choose another direction, right, left, or straight back the way he came from, back to his simple life with boat and nets. Jesus has made it clear what it means to follow him and Peter can either go along with it or get out of the way. But by no means can he stick around if all he plans to do is become a stumbling block, putting his foot up to trip up Jesus on the way to the cross. The accuser has already tried that, and Jesus didn't fall for it then, nor will he now. Is Peter with him or not? To stay with Jesus will mean helping to carry the cross, even after the crucifixion. What does that mean? It means continuing to defy the Roman Empire, resisting the status quo, and remaining in solidarity with the oppressed. Yeah, that would make the disciples more enemies than friends. It might even cost them their lives. But as Jesus had observed, anyone bound and determined to save their own life will in a sense lose it. It's called selling out. Anyone whose life was defined by their commitment to following Jesus better stay on that path or lose that which has become their life. They could gain all the fame and fortune of the world, but what good would that do if they had lost their commitment to the thing that mattered the most? So at this particular crossroads, Peter and the others begin to realize what it really means to follow Jesus. And their experience is one that we too will eventually have on our journey as Jesus followers probably more than once. Like the early disciples, we all come to our own crossroads moments when we realize what it actually means to follow Jesus and we have a decision at that point, stay on the path or turn back. Because the cross of Jesus isn't just a symbol for us to wear around our neck as a declaration of what Jesus did for us. Jesus did endure the cross because he refused to turn his back on the world so beloved to God, which does include all of us. But Jesus' journey to the cross does not entitle us to stroll down easy street. Our commitment to following Jesus, it does mean taking up the cross. And that doesn't necessarily mean simply wearing it around our neck or on whatever part of our body we feel might attract the most attention. In fact, displaying a cross just to attract attention is probably the opposite of what Jesus meant 
when he told his disciples to take up their crosses and follow him. I saw a man walking down the street one day near a shopping mall where tons of passers-by could see him. He was wearing a white robe and sandals, walking slowly and bending over rather dramatically under the weight of his burden. Can you guess what he was carrying? A wooden cross. Nowhere near as big as an actual Roman cross, which I am told one person never could have carried alone. Jesus himself likely only carried the cross piece of it, as the entire thing was simply too enormous for one person to carry on his back. But that guy by the mall, well, he was doing his best to play the part with his robe and sandals and his cross, walking down a busy road where everyone could see just what a sacrifice he was making. Now, I didn't stop and talk to him. I don't know what that guy typically does with the rest of his life, but simply carrying that cross, I don't think that's what Jesus meant. In fact, I don't think it really did much of anything to advance the message of Jesus. If anything, it detracted. I'm not going to re recommend the practice of dressing in bed sheets and carrying wooden crosses through town, guys. We Christians have enough of a branding problem as it is. What I think Jesus actually meant by taking up the cross is that we should look around and notice who is carrying a burden they cannot manage, and we should seek to lighten that burden. That is, after all, what Jesus and his disciples did, right? They sought out the sick, the hungry, the lonely, the poor, and they offered the kind of meaningful help that they could, taking some of the pressure off of those who were struggling. And if we want to follow in that path, then we are to do likewise. Personally, I choose to follow Jesus not because I think that he'll eventually give me some kind of a special blessing or even carry my burdens for me, but because I would like to be part of a community that shares the burdens of life. I would like to be part of a movement that seeks earnestly to lighten the burdens of those who have been given far too much to carry. Of course, this is not the work of one person, which is why even Jesus never ever tried to do it alone. It's always the work of the community. Remember, we call this the body of Christ that is comprised of all of us who follow Jesus. Each time we are presented with a real life opportunity to follow Jesus by helping others carry their burdens, we stand like Peter at the crossroads of faith. What will we do? Will we follow? or will we turn the other way?